So, um, let me uh, start by giving you a little bit of the framework of my talk. Um, I'm going to talk first about early experience. Uh, I'm a developmental psychologist and a pretend neuroscientist. Um, uh, and I'm interested in the effects of early experience writ large. Um, and the Bucharest Early Intervention Project that I'm going to be talking to you about is really a study that has allowed me to go into depth about uh, issues about the effects of early experience. Um, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time briefly telling you about uh, critical or sensitive periods in development. Um, and then I'll go into the history of the project um, and then talk about some findings of the project. And I put in uh, a couple of slides. I still call them slides, right? I still call them slides. Um, uh, at the end of my talk, for some data, um, actually, that is in a grant uh, submission that we are, are currently about to submit. I was telling Ariel a little bit about it um, uh, in terms of our uh, trying to continue funding on this particular project. Okay. So, role of experience in postnatal development. Right? Um, developmental psychologists, uh, I think most people believe that experience is the engine that drives most postnatal brain development. Um, and then there's a discussion, uh, debate about whether there are some experiences that are universal and that are experienced by every species um, and others that are not so universal, but are unique to certain cultures, some certain societies, certain families, and so on. Okay, and um, we try to distinguish between these two types of experiences. Um, there was a paper many years ago, 1984, in the journal called Child Development by a neuroscientist by the name of William Greeno, in which he uh, talked about experience expectant and experience dependent processes. Experience expectant are those that the brain, you know, metaphorically now, right, uh, expects, uh, and experience dependent are those that are unique to particular uh, uh, individuals. Um, so, in most cases, both classes of experience uh, occur, and they often occur in a window of time during which, uh, which we call a critical period um, for the development. Now, critical or sensitive periods, when I first uh, started thinking about this work and I was part of this group that was studying uh, the effects of early experience on brain development, um, when you talk to neuroscientists, like real neuroscientists, they say when you talk about critical periods in development, they say, of course, there are definitely critical periods. When you talk to psychologists, you know, not so much, right? We don't know that there are these uh, types of experiences. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what we mean by critical periods, and then we'll go on to see uh, what we know about critical periods in human development. Right? So this is a, uh, a, a cartoon or a figure from a paper by a neurobiologist by the name of Takao Hench, who's at Harvard, who studies uh, critical periods in the visual system. Um, and the whole point of this, uh, there are really two points, right? One is that it's the environment that is impinging upon brain development during this critical period. But the other point is in terms of plasticity of the brain, Right? That um, what you see is that the brain develops uh, at different uh, rates for different parts of the brain and for different processes. So sensory processes develop earlier, motor and language next, and then sort of all cognitive processes later. And so the effects of experience on the brain for these processes is obviously going to differ depending upon the time at which. Uh, the experience occurs in development. Does that, does that uh, make sense? Okay. Now, before neuroscientists talked about uh, uh, critical periods, 
ethologists talked about the critical experience. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. Conrad Lorenz, right? And so he talked about imprinting, and they're the ducks that are uh, going after Lorenz. But the point of Lorenz's experiment was that it was the timing of exposure right after the duckling hatch that was important in terms of the imprinting behavior. The first neuroscience evidence was by Eubel and Wiesel in the 60s. Um, they uh, studied kittens. First they studied kittens uh, and then non-human primates. Uh, and they were interested in the visual system. And they uh, manipulated visual experience of the kittens. And then they looked in an area of the brain called striate cortex to see what the effects of the manipulation of that experience was uh, on uh, that development of that area, right? And what you see there, the reason it's called striate cortex is that there are lines, it's striated, right? And when you look at it under electron microscope, so you can see there a normal striate cortex, and then when you are deprived of the brain, you get these perturbations in striated cortex as a function of that perturbation. But the other thing that Jubel and Wiesel noted, in addition to the effects of different kinds of experiences, is that it was the timing of that experience that was important. If the monocular deprivation occurred later in development, didn't matter, right? If it occurred earlier, didn't matter. It had to occur at a particular point in time in the development of the visual system in order for it to have the particular consequences that it did. Okay? Now, there's actually a human analog to the Eubel and Wiesel experiments that was a natural experiment that was uh, conducted by a developmental psychologist by the name of Daphne Maurer. We'll talk about Canada. She's at uh, McMaster University uh, in Canada. Um, and what Daphne did is she recognized she studied infants that were born with bilateral cataracts. So they were deprived of pattern vision very early in life. And back when she studied them, neuroophthalmologists were still uncertain about how young they could operate on these infants in order to remove the cataracts. And so here was this natural experiment. She could look, follow these infants up, and she could look at the age at which they got the surgery to remove the cataracts, and all of a sudden they had pattern vision, just like the kittens, you know, with Jubal and Wiesel sewing their eyelids uh, shut. Uh, and what she found is, in fact, that the age at which they got the surgery affected their uh, visual development, right? The later they got the surgery, the more it, it was affected, right? Um, there are also other species that have, um, uh, and other researchers who study critical periods. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, this, uh, this is Eric Knudsen, who is a neurobiologist at Stanford, who's part of this group that I was in. And he studies barn owls. Um, and what he is interested in is the integration of auditory and visual experience. So auditory visual information is very important in terms of early development when you think about these two sensory systems. Uh, being integrated together. Knudsen studies it in the barn owl, and the way that he studies it, he studies it in an area of the brain in the barn owl called the optic tectum, which is the area where auditory and visual information get integrated. He can measure that in level of integration to the microsecond in terms of the input of the visual and auditory information. But the way that he studies it is he manipulates early experience of these baby barn owls. He either puts earplugs in them, or my favorite slide here, he puts goggles on them so he deprives them of that of normal visual experience. And he finds that, in fact, early experience perturbs the integration of auditory information. Um, closer to my uh, home uh, in Maryland, that's Maria Bedney. And she studies, she actually does uh, fMRI experiments um, with people who were born blind. And she looks to see um, what the brain response is to language while they're laying in the scanner. Um, and what she finds is that they hear language, in quotes, in their brain. But where do they hear it? In the occipital cortex, which is normally the area of the brain that is reserved for 
visual information, in right? They, to they, sorry. In addition to the auditor. In addition to the auditor, right? Their visual, their occipital cortex uh, lights up as a function of uh, them being congenitally born congenitally blind. Okay, there you go. Now there are other examples in the developmental literature of what we think of as sensitive periods. That's Janet Worker, another Canadian. Right? She's at University of British Columbia. Janet studies the development of infant speech perception, their ability to uh, discriminate between co different consonants and vowels of different languages. And she finds that early in life, uh, infants can make these discriminations across multiple different uh, languages, but as they hear their own native language, there's a perceptual, what she calls a perceptual narrowing. Um, after about nine months of age, they are no longer able to make those kinds of discriminations, right? So that just says that. But Janet also wrote this really, what I think is important paper back some well, 10, 12 years ago, um, uh, uh, but what she argued is that there's not, even for language, for the domain of language, there's not just one critical or sensitive period, but there are multiple sensitive periods because you can divide language into multiple different competencies and each of them may in fact have its own uh, uh, sensitive period. Finally, there's the cow hench, um, and there's the paper from where I got that, uh, uh, that figure. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Takao studies the visual system and whether or not one can manipulate uh, the visual system to reopen sensitive periods. Because one of the things that I, I may not have mentioned is that the idea of sensitive periods is that you have this window and it's the time when experience has its maximum effect upon the brain, but then that window closes. So experiences, the same experiences after that sensitive period, no longer have the same effect, right? So if you kept the kitten's eyes closed and then showed them pattern visual information after the sensitive period, it did not fix uh, striate cortex. It did not, right? What Takao is doing is he's looking at the molecular biology of sensitive periods, and he has in fact found, can you reopen uh, sensitive periods, and the answer appears to be yes, right? He's actually manipulating the neuro uh, pharmacology, well, the neural uh, uh, system in order to reopen uh, sensitive periods in, in the visual system, which is the system in which he works on. Okay, two final points about experience. Uh, experience cuts both ways, right? If a child is affected or exposed to adverse uh, experiences during a critical period, um, or deprived of what I mentioned earlier, these expectable experiences, then brain development obviously could be undermined. Um, but the other thing is, is that brain plasticity changes with age, so that in some domains it's possible to, uh, uh, to change, although it's more difficult, and in others it's not not so possible. Okay, so the talk today is uh, what happens to brain development when there's a profound violation of what I'm mentioning as the uh, expectable environment during a critical period, um, and the, uh, the violation of uh, this critical period that I'm going to be talking about is profound psychosocial neglect. Um, and then the second question that I'll try to answer is whether or not uh, the exposure to extreme psychosocial neglect uh, can be reversed, right? So if in fact you have these perturbations that occur to, brain, to the brain and to behavior as a function of uh, the lack of input or perturbed input during a sensitive period, can that somehow be reversed? Okay, so a word about what I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to be talking about neglect, which is the most common form of maltreatment in the United States. Um, now, neglect is interesting because it's not the presence of things like physical or sexual abuse, right? It's the absence of stimulation, right? Um, and it, but it turns out that this is the most common form of maltreatment. 
Um, and it is also the form of experience that infants and very young children that are living in institutions generally experience. And it's also true to say, even though I'm going to be talking about Romania today, that there are currently in the world about 8 million children who are living uh, in some form of institutional uh, care around the world. Okay, so the Bucharest project, which I'm going to be talking about, is was designed to uh, examine the effects of institutionalization on brain and behavioral development. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to we're going to see whether or not we can remediate some of those effects as a function of intervention. Um, and then obviously we, we're doing this because we want to improve the welfare of children who are uh, living in institutions. Okay? Everybody with me? Good. Great. Okay. So a little bit about the background of the project. <coughs> um, <sighs> So, uh, in the 1960s, Romania, um, which is not very far from here, by the way, on the same time zone, um, and just a, a brief, trans tra uh, tra uh, a brief digression, the first time that I went to Romania, which was in 1999, um, I went into the, uh, uh, one of the hotels, and a lot of these hotels have casinos, people are gambling and on the, the the front of in the casino as you enter was the word Kupa. <laughs> so I knew <laughs> I knew something something was going on. Huh? Something made us drunk. Yeah. So, so uh, in the 1960s um, uh, Romania was ruled by a guy by the name of Nicolae Ceausescu, who was a communist uh, and a bit mad. Um, he believed that the way to, to enhance the, the strength of the country and the economy of the country was to increase the population. Romania was at that time uh, a relatively poor country um, uh, on a, under the uh, Soviet Union. And so what he decided to do is uh, increase the population by doing all the things that you see there. He hired uh, obstetricians uh, and gynecologists who were, uh, worked for the state, and they uh, went around checking women to see whether or not they were either pregnant uh, or lactating, and if they weren't, they could be fined. Um, uh, women and families were fined if they had less than five children, if they had more than five children, they were rewarded. Um, he uh, outlawed contraception and abortion. Now, um, the the there was uh, it's a poor country. One of the other things that he did is he moved many of the uh, people who were living in small villages to the city, so that they could increase. Uh, uh, productivity of the factories that were in the city and there were the families were obviously concerned at that time about what they would do with all of the children who were being born and so what he did is he set up a network of institutions around the country and the idea was you can have a baby a woman could have a baby in a maternity hospital and then if she could not take care of that baby, um, she could just leave the baby there. And the idea was that the state would take care of that child until the family felt that they could economically uh, take care of the, of the, uh, of the child. All right? So although we call them orphanages, an orphan means that you have your parents are no longer living, but about 50% uh, of the children that were living in institutions, by the time we got there, but, at the, but particularly by the time Ceausescu was overthrown, um, they had parents who were still alive. It's just that many of those parents had either uh, given up legal rights to the child, or they had abandoned the child, left the child in the institution, with this idea somehow that they were going to uh, come back and reclaim the child when, uh, when they were able to. 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. So again, I can only give you anecdotal uh, uh, anecdotes about it. Some were, most weren't. Is really is really the answer, right? Most weren't. So um, the results of this policy was uh, child abandonment. Um, families couldn't afford to take care of their children. They turned them over to the state, destroyed the family unit, uh, and there were thousands of, uh, of infants and children who were being raised uh, in institutions in Romania. Um, when Ceausescu was overthrown in the popular revolution in 1989, there were over 100,000 children who were living in these institutions uh, across Romania, poverty being the main reason. Um, those of us who are old enough to remember the, that the international media was in the country to uh, cover the revolution, um, but they, and what they did is they sent back video footage of the conditions of the infants and children that were living in these institutions, which were terrible. And so what happened is that many families from the United States, from Great Britain, from Canada in particular, uh, flew over to Romania to adopt uh, infants and children who were living in these institutions. Um, and without going into any detail, I'll be happy to talk about it if anybody has a question, this became uh, a corrupt process. And so after a short period of time, Romania closed international uh, adoption. And so that was no longer a way for infants and children to get out, uh, uh, get out of these institutions. Okay, if I can find my cursor, I might be able to play Okay, so this is a video that I took uh, when I went to the, an institution uh, uh, in Bucharest when we first started the project. And there are a couple of things uh, to notice. Um, well, there are num a lot of things to notice, but let me just point out two. The first is uh, uh, you can see that there are stereotypes. You know what stereotypes are? Right, rocking back and forth, you can see that going on, right? The second thing is, is that the young children are doing what we say when we code social behavior, aimless wandering. They're just sort of walking around. Now, I don't know, does anybody speak Romanian here? Okay, well, sometimes you get somebody. The other thing to say is that there's virtually no language, right? There's grunts and stuff of these children, but, but that's about it. Okay. Uh, well, how old are they? These are about two and three year old children. So the system remained, the political system of... Yeah, so after Ceausescu uh, was overthrown, there were, you know, 100, 200,000 children living in institutions, and Romania had no way of dealing with it. So at first they thought it could deal with it by international adoption, which was, you know, which quickly did not work. And so when we got there, which is 1999, 10 years after the revolution and the overthrow, or nine years, um, they, their children were still living in these institutions. Yeah? On average, how many caretakers were there per child? Yeah, so there were about two per 30. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But these are young children, yeah. nine years after. So the, the system continued. Continued. Okay. Absolutely continued. Right. All, all during that 10 year period of time after Ceausescu was overthrown, when we got there, the system was still continuing. So we would get to a maternity hospital and there would be a mom, she would, uh, a woman, she'd give birth to a baby and she was giving, um, leaving that baby off to be placed into an institution, right? This is a, a picture you could see of what the baby rooms look like, right? With the cribs sort of stacked up one after the other. Um, there was virtually no attention that was paid to the babies that were laying there except to be fed on schedule. It's a very sort of regimented uh, uh, world that these uh, babies and children were living in. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. I apologize if this is tangential. You're talking about coming in 10 years after yeah. the fall of the government. Is there any information on what happened to the kids that were born and raised and grew up 
this is no, it's a great question. And it's the question that we asked the day we were landed in Bucharest, right? Can you tell us, can we track, can we know something about the kids who have been living in these institutions, what, what has happened to them? The government, if they had any information, they did not share it with us. So we had no idea. Yeah, but it's a great question. Okay, so there's a history of work on institutionalization and its effects. I mean, I can talk for hours about that just by itself. Uh, John Bowlby, I don't know if that name is familiar to any of you, uh, wrote a, uh, a, uh, a monograph for the World Health Organization in 1950 about uh, children in institutions uh, and about the negative effects of institutionalization on children's development. And here's a list of some of the things that uh, have been known about the effects of institutionalization on children, right? Uh, externalizing problems, uh, deficits in cognition, syndrome that mimics autism, and growth stunting. And just to give you an idea about growth stunting, here are uh, two children. Um, can anybody guess how old, there's two girls, how old they are? Oh, come on. Three. Four. Four or five, thank you. That's a 17-year-old girl. Uh, and that's a 14-year-old. So there's significant growth stunting that occurs as a function of living in an institution. In fact, we've con uh, concluded that it's about one month, you lose one month of linear growth for every month that you live in an in institution. Yeah. So what's the counterfactual? Is that compared to the general population or compared to other parents that would be at risk of being in poverty and not being their children in these institutions? So sorry, I don't understand. So the growth stunting itself? So growth stunting is, is not, uh, uncommon in places where there's malnutrition, right? right? So, uh, but, it, but it also occurs as a function of lack of psychosocial stimulation in infancy, right? There are, in fact, interesting good uh, rat models that talk about the lack of stimulation and lack of uh, growth hormone being manufactured as a function of the lack of that stimulation. But yes, you mean you get growth stunting as a function of malnutrition uh, as well, right? So if you look at the growth curve, say in parts of India, you get uh, growth stunting in both parts of Africa or Latin America. So this is with regard to Romanian uh, growth standards, right, that, uh, that we're showing this for non-institutionalized children. Yeah. Okay, so what's our design? We went uh, into Bucharest, we uh, wanted to do it with infants as young as we could. Uh, we started with uh, a group of 178 infants between the ages of six, well, children, between the ages of six to 30 months. Uh, we screened them for uh, uh, congenital uh, abnormalities and medical problems like cerebral palsy and eliminated them and were ended up with a sample of 136 children. And then we, uh, that were living in six different institutions in Bucharest, we then evaluated all 136 of them while they were still living in the institutions. After the, that evaluation was concluded, we randomized those 136 so that half of them were taken out and placed into families, one child per family, the other half remained in the institution where they were living. Now at this point in time, I always say, we did not randomize infants or children to go into an institution. These were infants and young children who were living in institutions at the time that we did this particular part of the study. We just took out 68 of them and placed them into families, okay? And then, we have followed them with that RCT. The RCT ended when the children were 54 months of age. That is, we no longer supported the foster care families after when the child reached four and a half, but we have continued to follow the uh, children up longitudinally, follow them up through our most recent assessment point was when they were 16 years old. Okay. 
Just to say, we are not ignorant of the fact, we're not ignorant of the fact, or ignoring the fact, that doing this particular kind of study comes with a certain uh, number of ethical consideration. And again, I'm happy to discuss those afterwards, but I just want to make note that, oh, he's talking about this study and he's never, they've never thought about the, the issue of the ethics of the study. And the answer is no, we have, and the study has been vetted multiple times uh, uh, regarding its ethics. Okay, just a word about uh, the intervention. Um, we call it foster care, but it was sort of the lexus of uh, foster care. Um, it was designed so that the families, each family that had one child, by the way, if there were siblings in those 136, the siblings went together. They weren't randomized separately, right? Um, the uh, one child per family, um, social workers and psychologists, who were involved in following up and working with the families, uh, getting material support, having a pediatrician. Um, we insisted that every uh, that for every family, at least one of the parents stay at home. We didn't want a situation where the family would take in a child, and then both parents would go to work and they put the child into daycare. We did not want that. We wanted the uh, fam one at least one member of the family to stay at home. And we also wanted two guarantees that are not up there from the Romanian government. One is that they would continue to support these foster families even after we stopped until the age of 18. And the second was that we would not take a, a, a child that was taken out of an institution and placed into one of our foster homes and be put back into an institution. Okay? And I'm happy to say that for the most part, we've been able to do both. That is, support the families over this long period of time and also prevent uh, any children from being placed back into uh, uh, the institution. Okay, now, unless I tell you otherwise, I'm, the data that I'm going to be telling you about is intent to treat. Does everybody know what intent to treat is? Yes, don't be embarrassed if you don't, right? So intent to treat is a very conservative uh, approach to the data, it's an RCT, right? So we can basically do a t-test between the foster care group and what we call the care as usual group. But just to say that, oh, oh and one of the other things that we insisted on, the Romanian uh, uh, Ethics Commission also <coughs> insisted on, is that we have a policy of non-interference. And what that means is, is that at age six or eight, if all of a sudden the biological family comes back to the foster uh, family and says, I want my child back, that did happen, um, we could do nothing about that, right? We, we had a policy of non-interference. That is, whatever was, was going to happen in, for those 136 children was going to happen. If a, if a child, and I'm happy to say that 90% of the children who were, had been originally randomized to be in the uh, institutional group were taken out and placed into foster homes or adopted or whatever, we had nothing to say about that. And by age eight, there were only 10 children who remained in the institution uh, uh, after that initial randomization. Did you have a question? Already? Yeah, um, everything you described is uh, basically um, economic and, uh, you know, standard of living, etc. But what about the emotional part? Were parents expected or uh, they knew that they, they, they could have, they would have to give away the child possibly or so on? Yes. Well, they knew they were foster parents, right? So um, they, could, they could, they could, they could if the if the biological parents had given up <coughs> legal rights, they did have the option to adopt the child. But if the parents did not give up the legal rights, they knew that there was a possibility that the biological family uh, could come back and claim the child. Right. Uh, in terms of emotional support, we had our social workers and psychologists who were working with the families up through 54, uh, 54 months of age. 
Okay, yes. Did you have a control group? Or like a normal uh, child, Romanian child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, did I not have it yeah, here? Yeah, 40, 40. Uh, 48 never institutionalized okay. children. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the findings now really quickly. Um, and I'm asking three questions, generally, of all of the data. One is, what are the effects of institutionalization? So that's during the baseline. The second is, is there an intervention effect? <laughs> and then the third is, with respect to the introduction to my talk, is there a timing effect? Does the age at which the child was taken out and placed into the, or exposure to the intervention, did that matter? Right, everybody? everybody got it? So those are my three questions. Okay, so baseline differences. We did something, do you know about the strange situation? Okay, yes? No? Everybody? Good, all right, great. Um, we did that, we videotaped it in the institution. This is while the children were living in the institution. So anybody wants to ask me like, who was played the mother in the strange situation? We'd ask them that question, right? So what we did is we did that by committee. We gathered all the caregivers together, and we said, okay, for this child, who is that child's favorite caregiver? That was the, played the mother in the strange situation when we videotaped them. We videotaped them there, and we sent the, those videotapes to the mecca of attachment research, to uh, University of Minnesota, to uh, Betty Carlson and Alan Srof, and they wrote back, and they said, we've never seen videotapes like that. So instead of uh, uh, putting them into categories, you know, the ABC categories, at that point in time, we came up with this five-point scale, right? Which five is stuff that they had seen before, and one through four was stuff that they had behavior on part of the child that they had basically never seen before. So here's what the data looked like at baseline, right? Here's the control group, right? 100% five. Here's the kids in the institution, right? So clearly, at baseline, there were significant effects of uh, institutionalization on the children uh, and the catchment in the children who were living there, okay? Um, we did, redid the strange situation with a variant on it at 42 months. Um, and here we then put them into these categories. And so here's what we found. There was uh, an intervention effect, right? So the foster care kids, you know, had a better uh, outcome in terms of security attachment than the kids who were randomized to the institution. But more interestingly to us, if you look at the timing, the age at which the child was taken out and placed into uh, foster care, right? You can see, I just, I, you, you can look at this continuously, but I blocked it here, right? So these are the kids taken out between seven and 18 months, 18 and 24 months, and so forth and so on. So if you're taken out before 24 months of age, you're much more likely to be rated as securely attached. If you're taken out afterwards, not so much. Yes? Do you have an explanation for why the difference between the younger and the older, or is that just a different way? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just a, 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 actually the number of number kids that we had who were, you know, below the age, below yeah. the, that certain age and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this slide, so it just tells me that. Okay. We also, one of the thing, unique things about this study, I think, is that we built a laboratory in one of the institutions in Bucharest. We brought over the uh, electrophysiological equipment to computers and amplifiers and things like that in order to do EEG and ERP studies with these children starting at baseline and then moving forward. And I'll show you just a little bit of data about that. Um, uh, this is uh, the EEG, for those of you who don't know, can be divided up into different frequency bands. Um, uh, the, the alpha and beta bands are associated with uh, attention and alertness. Uh, the delta band is more in terms of uh, sleep uh, uh, and drowsy. But this is what we found at baseline. Um, and this is in the alpha band. This is the control group. 
and this is the institutional group, and that's this is in the alpha band, and it's just power, just the amount of electrical energy in that frequency band that you see, and then you see that the that the never it's the control group is showing what you consider to be the normative uh, amount of power in the alpha band. The there's virtually none in the in the uh, institutional group. Um, it's as if you sort of turn down the the level of uh, brain output in uh, in those kids. Now we followed these kids up, and we did not see intervention effects in the children until around age eight. But at age eight, we did see changes in uh, brain activity. Um, these two lower ones, this is the control group, and these are the foster care kids taken out before 24 months of age. Those are the, that's the institutional group and the foster care kids taken out after 24 months of age. And, you know, seeing is, you know, the, the uh, uh, ocular subjective method, right? Um, this is uh, what you see here is that there's no difference between the foster care kids and who are taken out before 24 months of age in the control group and uh, the institutional group and the foster care kids after 24 months of age, no difference between them. And by the way, this uh, finding, this difference in power and finding uh, has maintained itself over, over the, uh, our continued follow-up. Sir, yes. EEG during just rest? Or? Just rest, right. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to show you EEG or ERP in response to a task. Okay. Um, so this just says timing matters in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the brain activity. Okay. We gave them a number of cognitive tasks, uh, including go no go. Everybody familiar with that, mm -hmm. right? So you, uh, right? They have a, a letter which is a go and letters that were no-go, the X is the, the no-go, right? And you're looking at reaction time, accuracy, and we can also record EEG, and we can get uh, uh, output of the EEG that's synchronized to both the go trials and the no-go trials, all right? And we do something called, we look at time, in a time frequency domain, um, and here we're looking at theta power in response to both the go and the no-go, um, and then you can subtract those two, and you get a different score. And that just shows you the amount of power in the theta band in response to both the difference between the go and the no-go. And when you analyze that uh, between the groups, what you find is that there's uh, increased theta activity uh, in the foster care kids during the no-go situation compared to the care as usual. Right, and that's a significant difference there. Now, what's interesting is that if we look at age of placement, we find that there's a significant correlation here in age of placement. So that the kids, the foster care kids, who are taken out before 24 months of age, they're showing heightened theta power, which is what you would expect in, a, in typical kids, compared to the foster care kids taken out after 24 months of age, or the kids randomized to care as usual, okay? What I didn't tell you about these data that I just showed you is that these data are from age 16. All right, so I'd just like to think about that just for a second. Age 16, they, the mean age um, at which they were placed into uh, the foster care or randomized was around two. So we're talking about 14 years after the uh, randomization and after the, uh, the intervention. The intervention ended when they were 54 months, four and a half. So that's 12 years after our input into, in, uh, into the intervention. We're still getting timing effects uh, and uh, intervention effects. Yes. Can we assume that they were all uh, institutionalized at the same age? No. No. Is that something you can prove? Oh, uh, oh, institutionalized. Um, the majority of them were institutionalized uh, right after birth. There were some kids who were institutionalized uh, a month, two months, and three months after birth. Um, but when you control for that, look, that doesn't seem to have, a, uh, have an effect. But yes, we did look at that.
Yes. To the fossil care uh, relate to persistence of schooling or all the other outcomes that might be, might be mediating the school? Yeah, so get the answer is yes. So the kids who were placed into foster care, you know, they lived with a family and they went to the neighborhood school. Uh, and so their educational experiences were going to be different than uh, the kids who were randomized to uh, be in the institution. So sure, I mean, over that uh, period of time. Nevertheless, if you think about that's true about the kids who were placed into foster care after 24 months of age. Yet they don't show the, the same intervention effect as the kids who were placed before 24 months of age. Okay. Um, a couple of other findings. So, actually, two other areas. How am I doing in time? Okay. Oh, great. All right. So one of the questions that we ask is like, what could be, what are the, what, are, what could be the mechanism that is underlying uh, the changes that we see? And I only showed you a, 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 you know, a smidgen, right, of the findings that we have as a result of early experience of adversity on these kids. Um, and for that, we looked to the. Uh, neuroscience literature to the animal literature because there you have the ability to experimentally control the effects of early adversity, right, in terms of internal separation, in terms of whatever other kinds of things that you can do to a mouse, a rat, or uh, another species or a non-human primate, right? Uh, and what that literature really tells us and directed us to is that stress, uh, the stress system, stress reactivity seems to play a major role in terms of uh, both uh, the development of behavioral responses to later uh, uh, stress, but also in terms of brain changes uh, that are a function of uh, exposure to adversity. So we decided to assess stress responses in these kids. Um, this is when they were age 12. We put them into a paradigm called the Trier response test. Anybody not know what that is? Don't be embarrassed. Good. Um, so it was, Trier is a city in Germany that, uh, where they developed this uh, test. And it was developed to look at the uh, cortisol response to stress. Like cortisol is a hormone that's uh, manufactured in the HPA system uh, that is thought to reflect and acute elevations are thought to reflect uh, response to stress. Um, and so the, it, it uh, consists of telling a subject, a participant, that they're going to have to give a speech, that uh, you give them the topic of the speech, then you make them give the speech, and you have two people in white coats sitting there with, with uh, clipboards, and they're giving them critical comments. And then afterwards, you have a, a, a period of time where they sit still, and then they're tell, said, okay, now we want you to count backwards by sevens from 1,412. Ready, go. And then, you, and then you give them that kind of test, uh, and you talk to them about their accuracy. All that time, you are assessing their cardiovascular response because the uh, significant output, immediate output of the stress uh, system is cardiovascular activity heart rate, parasympathetic and sympathetic activity, as well as cortisol. Now cortisol takes time, it's the, there's, a, uh, there's a different time lag for it, but nevertheless that you can look at that as well. Okay, so we gave that to our kids, we measured heart rate, sympathetic response, blood pressure, uh, and we had them spit into test tubes and uh, assess cortisol response, okay? Uh, and here's what we found. So the black bars are the control sample. NIG means never institutionalized. The gray bar is foster care kids. The white bar are the care as usual kids. So uh, what we saw uh, is that the uh, control sample showed us a typical response to the trier. So a typical response to the trier is to get stressed out. And when you get stressed out, your heart 
rate goes up. And so they showed that. The care as usual kids did not show the blunted response. Um, now they showed that, that's true for heart rate. Ooh, that didn't come out. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Here's speech, prep, and math. You can see it's true for heart rate. It's also true for sympathetic activity, right? PEP. It's true for parasy uh, parasympathetic activity, sympathetic activity, and blood pressure, diastolic and systolic. You get the same pattern that the uh, control group is showing a typical stress response. The foster care kids are somewhere in between, and the care as usual kids are showing a blunted response. Okay? The final measure there is cortisol. And if you look at the three groups, that solid black line, that's the control group. They are showing what you would expect and what the trier was developed for. They show an elevated elevation in cortisol in response to the stressor and then a recovery. But you see there are two flat lines for the foster care kids and for the care as usual kids. Right? But wait. If you divide up the foster care kids into those before 24 months and after 24 months of age in terms of their placement, what you see, let's see if I can do this right, go backwards, the solid black line, that's the control group. The solid black line, that's the foster care kids who were taken out before 24 months. You see a timing effect for response, for stress response there as well. Okay, now what about other measures of brain development? That's where I'm going to end. Yes? Do you have an explanation for why this two years is the mark? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, can I wait to answer that question? Because um, you know, it was, it's been something that we have puzzled about. We think we uh, understand, but we, but I mean, it's a long answer that I'd like to hold, and I just want to finish, finish off the talk, if that's okay. All right, great. So one of the other things that we were able to do with the kids is we were able to do structural imaging. Um, we went to a clinic um, where they had a 1.5 Tesla magnet, they, and paid them, and they allowed us to do imaging of, uh, of the sample, okay? Uh, we did it at both ages eight, and most recently at age 16, and so these data on age 16 are hot off the press here. Um, uh, okay, so here's what we found. This is just the details on the, the numbers and what we did, and um, how we, uh, analyze the structural data. We also have DTI data, which I won't be uh, showing you today. Um, but here's the, here are the data um, on uh, eight years. This is gray matter, so neurons, right? Um, there's no intervention effect. No timing effect, no intervention effect. The, both the care as usual and the foster care kids have smaller gray matter compared to the uh, control group, right? That's true at eight, and it's also true at 16. Now, everybody increases, and so that difference that you saw at eight sort of is no longer significant, but you can see sort of um, the pattern there. Now, if you ask, are there expected changes in intracranial volume between eight and 16? The answer is yes, there are no group differences. Right? Um, everybody is showing uh, the expected increase. If you ask, what about white matter? Right? White matter, you do see a difference. Right? Um, the, let me see if I get my, right. The blue line, can everybody see that? The blue line are the care as usual. Kids randomized to be in the institution. The uh, red and green are the foster care and the control group. And you can see that they're all showing an increase in white matter across this period of time, which is what you would expect. But you can see that both 8 and 16, there appears to be, there is an 8, um, a significant difference in white matter volume uh, with, that, with meaning an intervention effect. Yeah, uh, but as it's functional. like opposite. Like the, the never institutional, they are less than the foster care. 
These are the in these the are the this is the foster care yeah. and this is the uh, control group. Yeah. Right? There are no they differences there. Ah, it's not it's not no, no, no. Look at the, you can see the standard error error bars there. Ariel, did you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, so previous findings is that also in terms of cortical thickness, right? Um, we have found that the at eight, the uh, all the kids who had had a history of institutionalization had thinner cortices compared to the control group. So we again looked at age 16. This just tells you how we did the analysis. Um, and what we found is that the children in care as usual, right, had thicker cortices compared to the foster care kids, right? So let me show you what that looks like. And here are the two areas, ACC and inferior frontal gyrus, where that was significant with all of the multiple multiple corrections. Um, this is how we did it. So you see decrease, you see decreases in cortical thickness across age for everyone, right? Um, in, in, except for certain areas like motor and subcortical. And that's not unusual because everybody should be familiar with this picture which has been around for a while, which is uh, by J. Gee in which across development you see general thinning of the cortex, right, with development. But what we found is that in the care as usual, show less change in cortical thickness compared to the uh, uh, foster care kids, and particularly in this particular, these particular two regions, which is where you get the statistical. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, we find differences in cortical thickness. Um, uh, but only in the institutionalized, the care as usual group and not the foster care group. Remember, this is all intent to treat. They're no, they haven't been living in the institution for a while. Mm -hmm. This is at age 16. Mm -hmm. uh, most have not been living in the institution for half their lives, right? But uh, we still find the effects of this early adversity on, uh, on brain. Okay. And change across the period of normative. Okay. So you have these initial differences that have resolved in thinning, but not in the edge. Okay. All right. So now I just want to end with sort of a couple of quick tables, and then I'm done. Um, not all domains show recovery, and not all domains show the effects of early adversity. So let me show you. Uh, here is a sort of a list of domains that show uh, intervention effects, but no timing effects. That's right. We still find an intervention effect, which is great, but uh, no timing, no sense of period. Here are domains that are unaffected by adversity. Now, one of my colleagues on this uh, study is a guy named uh, Chuck Nelson, Charles Nelson who has been studying face processing forever. That's where, how he started out. He could not believe. We, we did every assessment of face processing that you can imagine at every age because he could not believe that early adversity did not affect face processing or emotion recognition. But we found no, no effects of early adversity <coughs> on either of these. Yeah? So, uh... I, don't, I just want to clarify. You're not saying that earlier adversity doesn't affect. You're saying neglect specifically because there are studies that show. Yeah. So the, so one of the yeah. So one of the ones that's cited most often is Seth Pollock's. Mm -hmm. It's a group of kids who have undergone physical abuse, yeah. and it's their response to angry, mm -hmm. angry faces. Right. These kids did not, for the most part, undergo any kind of physical mm -hmm. abuse. It was really mal a neglect, mm -hmm. right? And in the instance of neglect did not find. Yes, I should be you know, specific about that. Thank you for that. And here are domains where we got no intervention effect, but where we got uh, significant problems, and in particular externalizing uh, problems, and in particular ADHD. So we have measured uh, psychiatric problems in these kids since starting at age 54 months, 
and an 8, and again a 12, and now it's 16. And we see intervention effects in terms of uh, some domains in the psychiatric uh, uh, and, and, uh, in disorders uh, and symptoms, but never have we found uh, an intervention effect uh, with ADHD. Okay, last slide, and it's going to start to answer your question. So here's the list where we're finding these timing effects. And you can see it's all below. Some of them are not 24 months. Some of them are earlier, right? In particular with language, right? Now we have a smaller sample, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, we're getting this below age 24 months as a period of plasticity. Now you're going to ask me why, and the short answer is we don't know. We think, I just went to a talk um, at uh, APS, and I'm blocking out things. The guy who wrote the book, uh, Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map, it was John O'Keefe, and there was the second author. He gave a brilliant talk. He's at the University. Lynn Nadell. Ooh, I got it. Lynn Nadell, brilliant talk studied the hippocampus, uh, 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 all of his career. And although the whole, he's giving this talk, he's talking about 24 months as being the developmental period where hippocampus comes online in terms of associated learning, in terms of episodic memory. So I offer that <laughs> as there's some, there are developmental processes that are occurring. And when I asked him about this, you know, he said, well, you know, the same sort of molecular uh, imbalance that the cow hench studies uh, in terms of uh, the energetics that open up and close sensitive periods, he studied in the hippocampus. Um, and he believes that that's what is occurring at around two years of age in humans. In human children. How so, does he study this in human? Huh? How does he study this? Well, he doesn't study the mole molecular, mm -hmm. he studies that in rats. Mm -hmm. But he studies uh, sensitive periods in hippocampal development by giving them sort of all sorts of hip, you know, spatial learning. In, ra no, in rats. Oh, in rats, yeah. That's the reason. It's not a great answer, but it's the, only, <laughs> it's the answer that we have. Okay. Uh, we have a long list of people who have worked with us on this study um, and who continue to work uh, with us. Uh, and here's the picture of all of us with our Romanian staff, right, who, uh, that's Chuck Nelson there and Charlie Zina uh, behind the, the Romanian uh, staff who works with us and can has worked with us uh, all this uh, period of time. So, I will stop there and thank you and happy to entertain any questions. Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, do you follow these children? I mean, they are not children anymore, but do you follow them for like, more years? Than so the we have, um, so the short answer is yes. The longer answer is I was telling Ariel, do I have time to show yes. another slide? So the longer answer is yes. As telling Ariel, we put in a, uh, a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health, which is where we have gotten our funding, to say we want to see these kids at age 20, right? Because we think it's important by you know, entering into adulthood. <clears throat> and they wrote back and they said, no, we're not going to give you the funding because what you're proposing to do is not innovative. And they went on to say is that we've learned everything that we need to learn about <laughs> sensitive periods in early childhood and about the effects of adversity, and we no longer need to, to, to have the, this study funded. Mm -hmm. So um, we, had to, we put our heads together to think about how we could uh, think about uh, an innovation that was more than just, are you kidding? This is a very important sample, the only one of its kind, blah, blah, blah. And what we, what we uh, uh, thought about, which is something that's current in uh, the literature, is this idea is that there's more 
And I sort of introduced it earlier. There's more than one sensitive period in development. And in fact, there's a lot of discussion now about adolescence mm -hmm. being a second sensitive mm -hmm. period. I, I, I don't have time to go into what the evidence of that is. Mm -hmm. But we have some evidence that in fact that may be the case within our uh, sample. So let me show you what that is. So this, I took this all out of the grant that we're about. <laughs> um, this shows you, um, we're looking at psychopathology here, right? So we're looking at uh, psychopathology is ages eight and at age 16, and the groups are divided by the quality of caregiving that the child has experienced in between these two periods of time, all right? And so our idea, if anybody knows anybody who's gonna be a reviewer of our grant, <laughs> is that there may be a second hit so that even though you've undergone adversity early in life, if you have uh, enhanced environment, caregiving environment during adolescence, that may be the second hit that, that during adolescence provides uh, a positive outcome. So the group to look at, right, are the blue group, right? Uh, sorry, the, this group, right? Because this is the group that were randomized to the institution, right? Were not placed into good environments but ended up in adolescence to get, uh, to have more positive caregiving environment. And their level of psychopathology, right, is better than the kids who have remained in crappy uh, environments. And that's true also for cognitive control. We assess that with something called the CAN-TAB. Right? So this is one of the, uh, one of the things as you can see here. So that's the control group, right? Um, here are the uh, FCGs, the foster care kids who had good quality, right? And here are, right, the care as usual who also had good quality. And so there's a direction in which they are also showing um, the, this uh, response to a positive environment during uh, during adolescence. And so our argument in the grant, which if you buy, that's a good sign because maybe our reviewers will as well, is that maybe the second period of time, you know, provides another uh, period where uh, quality intervention may may benefit children who have undergone early adversity. And if I can add another point. Yes. <laughs> now I'm done. The networks only, so the mature adult phenotype only establishes at around 20, 22 years of age. So uh, all the, the intrinsic first instinct networks do not get the final phenotype before uh, this age, which means that they are still, there's a lot of plasticity uh, by this time. Yeah, but the common, well, yes. Um, we can't look at rest, we can't do functional uh, MRI in Romania, so we can't. But that's, that. uh, just support the fact that but, the, the brain yeah. did. I mean, where the there, the evidence is, uh, uh, the recent evidence is in cortisol and showing uh, uh, reorganization in puberty uh, with uh, cortisol reactivity um, uh, uh, during, a, during adolescence. But yes, that's just also, but we should put it into our. And you can also find the measure of GTI. Oh yes, I didn't show. We also have a finding with DTI, which shows the same pattern for the caregiving, for positive caregiving during adolescence. Okay. We have time for one more. I have just the second question. Oh, okay. Uh, is it? Uh, do you think is it uh, uh, genetic? Uh, is it like if you will take the children of the, these children, you will see their brain? I mean, epigenetic. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We are actually, some of the, of the uh, women in our sample have children. And so we are studying those uh, infants right now. But I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. You mentioned a group of children that were put 
seen that foster families together with their siblings. Yes. So do you have anything to say about this group of children? Um, no, only anecdotally, because there are so few. There are only two that were uh, two pair that were randomized, both to foster uh, families. So you know, it's really not. Uh, I, I can't really comment about about them, except that they're doing well. <laughs> but, you know, that's it. Unfortunately, we have to end, so you make your tour of the old school. Oh, yeah. Time. Mm -hmm. um, right. Thank you so much for packing the Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a good answer for you. Yeah. Thank you.